you know, as of the year 2020, the, the major liberal or institutions stopped being liberal. That they, they made this sharp transition to a, 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 an aggressive form of neo-Marxism. Joining me from Jerusalem today is the president of the Herzl Institute, Dr. Yoram Hazoni. As a prolific author and speaker on the topic of nationalism, conservatism, common sense, public policy, and good governance, I'm honored to welcome him on the show. As the chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation and a key voice in the conversation around where the Western world has gone wrong, I'm excited to dive into his newest book, Conservatism, A Rediscovery. Today, a special episode of Return to Reason, where knowledge and wisdom intersect. Well, Yoram, thank you so much for joining us today. I am excited to get your knowledge, your wisdom on what I think more and more people need to be absolutely educated on when it comes to political ideologies, but particularly in conservatism. And you've written a book recently called A Rediscovery about conservatism. Uh, it's, it's a must read for everyone. If you're watching, you have to pick up this book just to get a, a, a ton of, of wisdom in terms of where it comes from and what conservatives are really trying to do. Yoram, I'm interested in your title. Why, why did you d name it a d rediscovery? Why that term? First of all, David, thank you for having me on. It's uh, certainly a, a pleasure. And uh, look, why, why a rediscovery? I, I think an awful lot of people e either already know or at least suspect that, you know, that if you're living in a Western country, uh, a lot of the, you know, whether it's politicians or, or academics, intellectuals who use the term conservative are describing something that uh, has not really succeeded in conserving very much. And especially mm. when I talk to, you know, to people under age 30, that's the first thing that they almost always say is, you know, why on earth should I be inter interested in conservatism? You guys, you guys haven't conserved anything for generations. Hmm. And I think, I, I think this, this question is completely fair. And I, I wrote the book in order to try to understand, to, to, to answer the question. Um, and the answer to, to put it in a really short form, the answer is that somewhere around the last uh, 40, 50, 60 years, uh, conservatives gave up on uh, what we could call, let's say, traditionalism, on yeah. trying to uphold the political and religious traditions of uh, their own nations. And they swung into uh, trying to defend uh, almost exclusively individual liberties. Hmm. Um, now, individual liberties and equalities that there's all sorts of good things about them yeah uh, but 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 they really are not the heart of conservatism liberalism and there's different different kinds of liberalism there's progressive liberals and classic yeah. liberals and also libertarians but liberalism is about the rights of the individual the freedom of the individual the equality of the individual and trying to construct a politics that's based almost exclusively on consent so if if that's the way you see the world, and I'm not trying to insult anybody, but if that's the way you see the world, then the correct way to to describe that worldview is liberal. You're a liberal. Hmm. Conservatives are something else. Conservatives begin with the assumption that there is a, a, a people, a nation, a religion, a tradition that needs to be preserved, repaired, and strengthened and upheld. Okay. That that's that's the heart of conservatism, and because we uh, have lost that that heart of conservatism in so many you know conservative political parties and and, and newspapers and 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 youth movements, uh, I kind of wanted to set the record straight, and that's what the book is for. Question for you: There's there's a book that I came across a while ago, and I believe it was titled Why Liberalism Has Failed. I believe it was from Patrick Danini, if I'm correct. Um, and, and he's trying to put out an idea that liberalism, essentially, as the rise of liberalism in the West world over the last 60, 70 years, you want to say, uh, hasn't reached the results it initially was intending. Have we seen a failure of liberalism generally? In general, I think his approach is uh, is correct. I think that... Okay. that uh, what he's what he's zeroing in on is that uh, somewhere around the middle of the 20th century, um, liberalism 
one as one outright. You know, so you, some people say in the 1940s, others say in the 1960s, others say in the 1980s. It, it you can argue about uh, about that, but basically the argument is that up until the middle of the 20th century, th there were no societies that were you know kind of pure liberal societies. All societies still had this th this massive inheritance uh, from from Christianity, from their their inherited constitutional traditions. Uh, certainly, in in you know this is true of all English speaking countries. And after the two world wars, there's a uh, there's a a very rapid shift uh, in which you find the major political parties, both left and right, saying something like look, we just can't allow another world war. We can't allow this to happen again, which is a completely reasonable reaction. Yeah. But the, the unreasonable reaction is that, that they decided that the, the solution, the permanent solution to these kinds of you know, massively evil wars was liberalism. Hmm. And uh, that if you set aside traditional politics, you set aside religion, you set aside nationalism. You set aside the the the, um, uh, the, the traditional ways of thinking about politics. Yeah. Uh, then you would be able to just have kind of like a pure, a neutral state based only on the equality of individual liberties. And the the idea was that that was supposed to give us all basically what we want. And yeah. Patrick Patrick's argument, which. Uh, I, I elaborate in my book as well. His, his argument is that um, that when people threw out the conservative part, when they threw out God and Scripture, when they 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 threw out uh, sanctity and honor, when they threw out the the traditional family and the concept of uh, of uh, the nation state, the independent nation state. And, and now, most recently, even you know, even the 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 traditional idea of what a man is and what a woman is, yeah. when when these things were thrown out, instead of creating this this neutral liberal utopia where everybody is free and everybody's kind to one another, uh, what happened is is almost the opposite. That yeah. uh, that young people who grow up in uh, in a liberal society, and, and their parents say, look, the important thing is that. You know that you're free and you're equal and you make uh, decisions on the basis of whatever you believe um the the parents say that the schools say that the government says that so it turns out that it lasts about two generations before it collapses into what we can call woke neo-marxism yeah. i know other people have other na names for it but but uh, as of you know as of the year 2020 um the uh the 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 major cultural institutions uh, across the United States, uh, Britain, other countries, I, I, I assume Canada as well, but you'll tell me. Yeah. Um, the, the major liberal or institutions stopped being liberal. They, they made this sharp transition to, uh, to, uh, to a, 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 an aggressive form of neo-Marxism, which uh, may still call itself uh, liberalism, but it's all about suppressing any opinions that are different from the approved yeah. woke neo-Marxist opinions. And the, the the central question, you know, for those of us who are facing this in different, you know, in, in the different countries in which we live, the central question has to be, is it enough to just repeat the old liberalism that was just defeated? You know, the, yeah. all these institutions, the New York Times and Princeton University, all these institutions just five years ago, 10 years ago, they were all liberal institutions and then they collapsed into woke neo-Marxism. Yeah. And the question is, is is just repeating liberal slogans and statements and theories, is that enough now? And, and both Patrick and I think that the answer has to be no. So you are, I'm, I'm in my mid thirties. Uh, and also being in Canada, just to clarify for people watching, we do have our main political parties are ironically called the Conservatives and the Liberals, which I would argue the Conservatives are not so much conservative as your book, uh, A Rediscovery of Conservatism, argues. It, you, as you mentioned, um, and I think this probably happens for a lot in the Western world, is that a lot of those, I'll call them guardrails, uh, 
<laughs> alongside right, uh, rights and freedoms, seems to be have thrown out the, the traditional family, uh, even gender roles, as we're talking about. All these things that seem to be... So, so if, if, I'm, if I'm a young neo-Marxist, right, talking to you, and I've got a worldview that, let's say, I, I would... David Craig would say would be maybe slightly tainted or, or might be, an, uh, to be kind, an interesting worldview to say the least. What would your argument be if we're sitting down talking and I ask you, why are you a conservative? And why should I consider conservatism? How would you answer that? What would your argument be with me? Well, look, when I'm talking to woke neo-Marxists or, or any kind of Marxists, I mean, the, the first thing I say is that I uh, I have some sympathy for their criticism of liberalism, okay? Because okay. the the reason so many young people go to university and become Marxists of different flavors is you know it, it is because when they listen to Marxist professors, they actually hear things that make sense to them, okay? And mm -hmm. that this is important also for for conservatives wow. to understand that the Marxist critique says, look, liberals only care about individuals. Okay. And they don't see that human beings actually tend to always form into groups, into different groups. And those those groups compete with one another and they oppress one another. Okay. And so the 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 Marxists, when they come in and criticize liberalism, that criticism actually wakes a lot of people up and they say, wow, that that that's true. Yeah. That in a liberal society where everybody's supposed to be free and equal, when you when you look at it carefully, you start to see that that people really organize themselves into groups and that those groups really do oppress one another. Okay, now the the big difference between the Marxists and the conservatives, the traditional conservatives uh, like like you know myself uh, or or, or Deneen, is is that when we look at the uh, the clumping of human beings into groups and the the rivalry and competition into groups we also see that as being natural but conservatives think that the uh that the strongest groups can uh adjust themselves in order to make the society that they dominate uh more just and more fair that if if the if the leading groups are serious about maintaining peace and justice in their society, then they can make an effort to bring other groups in and to give them things that they need. The Marxists, and this this goes all the way back to Marx. The Marxists look at the same thing and they say, no, no, we're not we're not buying that. the The strongest group always exploits and oppresses the weakest group to such an extent that the only option that you have is to overthrow them and destroy them. You make a point in your book about how there's slightly, a, in my words, I'll paraphrase, there seems to be even a different conversation that seems to be happening even between conservatives and, and liberals in a sense of, of what their worldview is. And, and just to give you a recent example, I'm sure that you uh, were aware and saw about one year ago of the trucking convoy that happened in Canada. Yes. Are you saying that there are, and again, I'm not trying to make a sweeping statement because that's tough, but are you saying that a lot of times people might consider themselves a conservative, but if they're really focused on rights and freedoms exclusively, that they actually would have more of a liberal worldview? Yeah, I, I, I think that many, many people uh, who call themselves conservatives really are some kind of liberal. But okay. in addition, there's also lots of conservatives at this point who they really do have uh, conservative intuitions and inclinations, um, you, you know, like a, 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 a loyalty, a, a loyalty and attachment to, uh, to, uh, to God, to country, to, to scriptural tradition, to, uh, to the traditional family, honor, sanctity, things we uh, other similar things. There are lots of people who have the, that kind of um, uh, feeling, but because of the fact that they go to school and they're taught that politics is all about rights and freedoms, they don't really have another language that they know how to how to use so well. Hmm, so good point. you know, so I I wouldn't immediately say, you know, that, that those truckers talking about their freedoms, that you know that they're all liberals because you know you can you can sure. look at. What was happening? Look, definitely one one way to look at it, a liberal way to look at it, 
is what are the rights that, that were being taken away from them. But you can also look at the same uh, demonstration, the same phenomenon, and, and ask, you know, look, uh, actually, a lot of those truckers, they come from, uh, you know, a certain uh, uh, social group, um, you know, what, what uh, uh, Hillary Clinton once called the deplorables. Yes, they're work. They're working class people. They have working class values and attachments, and there's and part of the struggle has to do with the fact that there are these um, hyper liberal university educated elites that that think that it's their job to dictate how the people you know how people in the other parts of society should live because they think that they have all the answers and that they don't need to listen. To these other groups okay yeah. so now now if you look at it that way then you're you're looking at the same event but more from a conservative angle where you say look um the 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 na nation state of canada it has different groups and it has different layers and different 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 parts to it and if you're in the strong group your job is to listen to and make peace with try to find a way to uh to if possible, to, to, to give honor to the, 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 the less powerful groups and to give them some of the things that they need. All right. So now yeah. I said all of that without even talking about rights. Yeah. But still, yeah. that's a conservative way to look at what's going on in a scene like that. So you look at what's happened in COVID, which just seems to have accentuated all of our weaknesses as a society anyways. Where has that brought us now? Where has this view of, of liberalism woke neo marxism which has really been rampant in the last five, 10 years as well. Where has that brought us now as a society in the Western world? Okay, well, look, I, as I said before, I, I would draw a sharp watershed, a sharp, sharp break historically uh, between the, you know, the traditional liberal basis of societies like American Canada yeah. and, uh, and, and actually, you know, most of Europe too. Okay. Um, which solidified and became kind of a consensus after the Second World War, and this cultural revolution that we're living through, which um, jumped forward and overthrew liberalism as kind of the dominant worldview um, two or three years ago. Yeah. And at, at this point, most of the people who used to, you know, who used to call themselves uh, liberals correctly, have. Uh, swung into this woke ideology, which has, you know, s s strong, strong Marxist elements and strong Heideggerian elements. Um, and a lot of them don't remember what it was like to be liberal anymore. I mean, that wow. it, it, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing. Now, there's, yeah. there's still, there's still genuine liberals. Okay, and I, I'm not one of them. I'm a, I, I'm a conservative, I have been all my life. But, yeah. you know, but I, I obviously have, uh, uh, liberal friends, and so so people like um, Steven Pinker or or sure. Barry Weiss, yeah. they're they're not really conservatives. That you know they are uh, traditional liberals, okay. and uh, and and they're very brave people, and they you know they're they're risking a lot in order to uh, to fight the uh, the woke neo Marxist takeover from a liberal position. Yes. Okay. Now that. First of all, that's just admirable that very, very few people have the have the guts to do that. And I, I would I admire it even if they're people that I don't agree with on many or most important things. Still, it's it's admirable. Yeah. And the, the second thing to, to notice about this is is that those of us who are uh, conservatives in, you know, in the more traditional sense of, of, of the word that, you know, we we think that. The, the real problem is that we we threw out when we threw out God and Scripture, uh, we also threw out all the basic ideas that hold society together, mm -hmm. and so uh, so conservatives will you know will say look look there there's no choice if if you want these Western countries uh, to survive instead of collapsing into you know like a like a communist dictatorship. And you, if you want them to to survive, there's no choice. There's going to have to be a repentance and a restoration uh, that that includes, you know, strong aspects of uh, the old uh, uh, biblical Christianity. I, I'm yeah. a Jew. I'm not a Christian. But yeah. obviously, in a society where the dominant religion was Christianity, 
that's where most of the people who are uh, who are willing to fight and pass on same traditions are going to be found is uh, is in those parts of society that are still Christian. Yeah. And our our job is, you know, if we're conservatives, is twofold. One is to become much more serious as conservatives, to understand what it means to be a person whose life is about conservation and transmission, yeah. about uh, about building building big healthy families. Uh, uh, gathering them together in big, healthy congregations, which know how to transmit uh, our 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 biblical inheritance and all the things that go with it, um, the 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 Anglo inheritance and all the things that go with it. Th that's one big job we have. That's such a good point, Yoram. Is that the the term that comes to mind is is actually being generation generational thinking is uh, when you're looking ahead, and, and I'm a, a recent father, my, my son's about to turn one years old, and obviously when you have kids, you start to think about generations. And that leads me to, to my next question. Have we seen um, conservatism in the past, have we seen that shape some of our nations and help us get to where we are today? In the book, I, I try to talk about conservatism at two levels. There's the, the level of a conservative politics and then, you know, about like uh, restoring uh, a politics that seeks to restore things, you know, at the national level, um, the public culture, the legal level. But there's also this other level, which is, you know, which which you're touching on that that hits people, I think, hard as soon as they start having children, which is that there's such a thing as a conservative life mm -hmm. where uh, where you and your wife purposely structure your life around the uh, the trans the inheritance and transmission of uh, uh, of crucial values okay and and that's something that i think i think a key thing to understand is that most people who even a young man a young woman they want to get married and have children right now most of them are are so cut off from the chain of transmission that they don't know anymore how to hold a marriage together. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it takes. You know, watching it in on 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 television or or reading books about it is nowhere near good enough. You have in, in order to know how to keep a marriage together, you have to be part of a community in which there are all these older people who are in their 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s who have kept marriages together and they they become the uh, the the models and the teachers for the younger people, and the same thing is true about raising children. Um, is you know it it it's wonderful to have you know to be having children, but I think it's very important to understand that that that, that there is no there's no no how to raise a child book that teaches can teach you what you need. The only way to to, to learn how to raise children so that they're strong and independent and traditionalist and give honor to the past and want to pass it on. And the only way to do that is to be part of a community that does that every day, every yeah. day, every week, every year. And so um, so I think uh, at, at this very basic level, the first thing we need to be talking about is is personal repentance which means you know even if you don't believe in god yes get get married and have kids but you've got to join you've got to find a congregation a christian jewish or some other similar thing uh, where you can learn the things that you don't you're not going to learn otherwise about keeping a family together about about raising children about about just a healthy society wow so here being in canada um and, and obviously this, I think Canada and culturally is extremely similar to the U.S. A lot of that bleeds over from the U.S. into Canada. Um, we have seen a rise, as you mentioned, this, this neo, these neo-Marxist um, ideologies. Concerned Canadians, concerned conservatives, so to speak, what, what can we do? Maybe, maybe people that aren't as, as educated or articulate as you are, and maybe for the everyday person that is working or building a family, values their church, values wherever they, their community group, whatever it might be, what can they do because they are concerned about where our society is headed? What's your advice? Okay, well, look, uh, I, I, I already said, you know, join a church, join a synagogue, as traditional as, as possible. Okay, so th that that's the first thing you can do. The second thing you can do 
is together with the members of uh, of 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 your uh, traditional religious community, you've got to take you've got to take back schools. Yeah. Right. I mean, for, for children to grow, ch children now e every place, and I'm including including you know uh, Orthodox Christians and Jews are send finding out that they're sending their kids to schools, and those schools are 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 being shot through with this Marxist ideology. You got to pull your kids out of those schools, and you got to start new schools. Now, different places, the, um, uh, th this is already happening, and you know one of the the the, the lights in this tunnel is uh, is, is that. Uh, in many, many different states in the United States, I don't, I don't know what what the case is in Canada, but suddenly, we're, you know, we've been hearing about school choice for you know for 40, 50 years, and mostly people did nothing. All yeah. of a sudden, there there are dozens of states in which steps are being taken to give parents the power to pull their kids out of the school and start a new school. Okay, and so the, I mean that's the second crucial thing is is save your children. From this blight, if you yeah. think that your schools are still liberal, they're 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 not. They're not liberal anymore. So the, the second issue is the schools, and as as soon as you've secured your you know your 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 church, your school, your community, right, then you can begin thinking about um, you know about what can we do you know at the level of the province, at the level of the nation. Yeah. But I, I don't I don't think it makes any sense at all to be. You know, throwing yourself and you know hook line and sinker everything everything and all into political action if what you are doing is continuing to lead a liberal life go to go, going to a liberal church or synagogue send your kids to liberal schools then like you, you are not helping the situation wow that's powerful it's is there's a massive assault here as well on the education system uh, it, it's a very real opportunity in manitoba of, of a new government joining in this next year that that the first thing they want to do is to defund private schools specifically catholic and christian schools that's the first thing they, they want to get done so it's a it's a real real issue that's happening and if you want to conserve and you're considered concerned about our children's future is you have to protect them, just like you are saying. I, I so appreciate how strong of a stand you're taking on that, because I'm, I'm with you on that. You are, you know, unfortunately, I, I wish that we could have three hours to talk, because we could probably talk that for three days straight, all of these issues, and we'll have to find some time on a longer forum. But I want my audience, I want people who watch our program, Return to Reason, to follow you, to know what you're up to, to support you with what you're doing. How can they keep track of your journeys and what you're up to? Okay, well, I, I, I have a website, uh, yoramchazoni.org, uh, and uh, uh, it's got all my books and essays, uh, and, and uh, uh, you can also go to nationalconservatism.org, nationalconservatism.org, that's one word, uh, that's an international movement of people who, uh, who think like okay. us, and uh, we, are, uh, we have a, a big annual conference in the United States, uh, it's going to be in uh, in in December this year in Washington, okay. but uh, we also have a a big UK NatCon UK conference which will be uh, in May. If you can if you can make it over, um, and if you if if you're a student and write to us, we may be able to 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 uh, help a bit with the the transportation. But please come to NatCon because okay. that's where that's where you meet uh, national and international figures. Who are worrying exactly about the subjects that we're talking about, and uh, uh, it's a great place to to just to come and make friends and get your batteries recharged. That sounds awesome. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's the first time hearing of it. I'm going to try my best to, to make it, maybe to both of them. As well, you've written past books that that are also really worth picking up. They're available anywhere that books are sold. Amazon, you can have it in a couple days, and you can get into it. Thank you, Doctor. Looking forward to doing this again. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, David. My pleasure. You are an essential part of this series. Support truth, knowledge, and wisdom by sharing this show with a friend. Visit returntoreason.tv. There, you can subscribe to our newsletter by clicking Become an Insider. Get the latest articles, episodes, and exclusive content. It's Return to Reason.